Hi, this is Brian Keenan from uh, the Bayshore Center at Five Alp, and this is interviews from the Mirwald, where we uh, spend a few minutes once a week speaking with um, some uh, interesting people who grace the deck of the Mirwald um, or have touched our lives in some uh, interesting way. If you want more information about the Bayshore Center or the AJ Mirwald, log on to bayshorecenter.org. Uh, in the meantime, thank you, Josh, Captain Josh Scornavacci, for joining us here on our inaugural interviews from the Mirwald. And uh, so Josh, you're the captain of the AJ Mirwald. This was uh, not a new gig for you here at the Bayshore Center, but how did you end up, uh, you know, a young guy like you from a uh, landlocked state like Pennsylvania, uh, being the captain of New Jersey's official tall ship? Oh, thanks for having me, Brian. That's kind of a long story. So I, um, you know, I wanted to learn how to sail so that I could eventually get my own boat, um, impress my current wife so that she would marry me, and then uh, sail around the world and go on expeditions to find different animals. Um, I haven't done the expeditions yet, but I did start to learn how to sail. So I started out as an apprentice on the, the clear water, and then I was a deckhand on the bounty. And I actually came down and worked the season here on the Mirwald as a deckhand under Jesse Briggs. And then from there, I went down to uh, Virginia, I was on Alliance for a couple weeks, and then went over to the West Coast and sailed on uh, Lady Washington as the bosun. But how does a kid, and, I mean, being a tall ship sailor is so, um, you know, specific. Uh, it's not like I want to be a policeman or a fireman. Um, what, you know, what triggered that interest in, in this industry? Uh, a couple of things. So there's adventure, right? You, you get a chance to go to new places that you potentially have never been before and a chance to explore them. Just being out on the water, um, is an adventure in itself because you never really know what's going to happen. And there's the opportunity to meet very interesting people. A lot of the crew can be quite um, interesting, I guess. And uh, lots of uh, animals as well. You know, you see whales, some mola molas, flying fish, dolphins, albatross, all sorts of birds. So it's exciting in that regard. Um, how, how so your background i understand you have um a bachelor's degree in biology yeah i went to penn state for biology mm -hmm. um i did do a couple studies up in canada on seabirds and down in uh, costa rica with um, coral reefs and mangroves and i worked for uh, new jersey autobahn as a field tech studying uh, beach nesting birds so when you came home from school with a, you know, you graduate college, you have all this student loan debt and you say, hey, mom, I'm going to go sail on a boat as my professional job. You know, and I'm going to live below deck and, uh, you know, be a pirate for a year. How does uh, how does your family take that kind of thing? Well, I didn't initially know I was going to keep doing it. I didn't even know what I was getting into. When I got on Clearwater, I didn't realize that tall ships were a job. I assumed I'd be getting on some fiberglass sailboat. And then I learned it's a big wooden boat. There's this uh, whole industry. Um, it's pretty close knit. So it's really easy once you're in to meet other people and to be able to move around and jump to different boats and then I guess it just gets a little addicting because of um, the diversity and the just, you know, uh, no day is the same. So that's exciting. It's definitely not an office job. So and as far as the parents go, sometimes they approve of it. And then of course there's some times when it just doesn't look like it's a great thing to do. <laughs> um. You, so you, you mentioned that you worked on the clear water, which is sort of the, 
grandfather of the um, tall ship industry educational programming, which we have here at the Bayshore Center and we do on the boat. Um, so this was your first season captaining the uh, AJ Meerwald and certainly an interesting season uh, with COVID um, and all the additional requirements. But what do you get out of the job? You know, it's, it's, it's a pretty tough job. You're up early, you're working late. Uh, you know, it's, you're working under, you know, some pretty challenging environmental conditions at times, whether it's brutal heat or cold, or sometimes there's beautiful days. And I imagine when the, when the sails are lifted and, you know, you have that moment where you connect with kids or the passengers on the boat, it's all worthwhile. But what has it been like to work as the captain uh, this season at the Bayshore Center? Uh, working as the captain is a lot different. Um, like I said, when I started on the Mirwall in 2015, I was a deckhand. Then I went and did a few other jobs, but then I came back as a bosun, and then I was a first mate for two years. I got to learn a lot, um, sailing under two other captains here. I got to learn different um, leadership styles and different ways of handling the boat. And I'm still learning every day as a new captain. And um, I even learned from the crew. So that's exciting because, you know, no matter what your position is, if you're a volunteer or an intern, you still have something to offer. Everybody has a different background. Everybody has um, different skill set. And that's kind of why you have a crew so that everybody can work together to accomplish mm -hmm. a, a larger task where one person it'd be very difficult for them to know all those different skills. Um, but as far as what I get out of it, um, like you said, I, I get to, I get the opportunity or the privilege to educate the youth and um, anybody really who comes on the boat about the environment um, and what's more important than, you know, protecting the environment because without that, uh, we don't really have anything. So. We get to kind of carry on that mission that was started uh, back when Megan brought the boat up to educate um, people about the importance of taking care of our waterways, keeping them clean so that we have resources to use there, um, not over depleting them, not polluting them. And uh, that's really important to me, especially, you know, as I said, as a biologist, um, educating people about the environment is what really attracted me to the mirror world in particular. Um, and then you get a chance to influence people and maybe even um, play a little role in directing their future. Some, some of the people that we get, you can tell are, you know, they, they have that glint in their eye and maybe, oh, well, maybe I'll do this later or maybe I'll make a difference and make a change to how I do things or how other people do things. You know, I imagine that for a lot of the passengers, it's the first time they've ever been on a boat, certainly on a sailboat. Um, and certainly, you know, that's pretty exciting. We take it for, you know, uh, granted, you know, the boat's here every day, we sail on the boat every day. But I, I loved hearing from um, one of our passengers um, up in Atlantic Highlands who said, she had never been on the Raritan Bay before, despite having lived in Atlantic Islands her entire life. You know, for so many people here in New Jersey, which, you know, New Jersey is a peninsula, we're surrounded by water on three sides. Um, so many of us, you know, we go to the shore, we go to the um, Delaware River, but we don't have the opportunity to look at our state from um, the water side and appreciate um, that experience. Sailing at a bivalve is beautiful. Um, and I enjoyed sailing with you this summer, particularly um, because you did such a great job explaining to me and to the other passengers what we were seeing. And, and so can you tell us a little bit about the sail at a bivalve and what that experience is like for people? Sure. I mean, um, the boat is located right here at our museum. It's actually the largest exhibit of our museum. So there's lots of artifacts right here at the Bayshore Center to explore. And then on the river itself, um, there's all sorts of uh, historical and environmental things to see. Um, 
there's bald eagles, there's herons, there's egrets, there's all sorts of migratory birds. And then there's lots of old schooners. So there's um, old wooden boats that you can see at one point in time, look used to look just like the Mirwald does now. They used to have sails on them, uh, but they're currently motorized oyster dredges or clammers or scallopers, depending on the boat. And um, there's areas where there's currently wetlands that used to have uh, entire towns that used to be um, some of the wealthiest areas in the entire state of New Jersey, um, like right across the river. Um, the only thing left is wetlands, but there was once a railroad and it looked much like Five Out does now, but even bigger. Um, so it's fun to be able to explore and see those things. You can see the East Point Lighthouse in the distance. When we go out into the bay, uh, you get access to lighthouses that you can only really get to by a boat or a plane. Um, so that's exciting because those are, are things that people don't normally get an opportunity to see. Um, and out in the bay, you know, a lot of times we'll see dolphins. I've even seen a shark jump, an uh, 11 foot shark jump out of the water, sand tiger. So pretty cool. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm amazed being, you know, a guy from New Jersey or from New York and now I live in North Jersey to find how rural New Jersey is down here in Bivalve and Cumberland County um, and how, you know, bald eagles are almost a dime a dozen. Um, it's, you know, you don't even mention it to you. You know, I saw a bald eagle today. It's every day that you get to see the bald eagles and you get to see um, the beauty of the marshes. And um, This part of New Jersey is particularly rural. Um, one of the reasons it's so rural is access to the bay is challenging because of the vast marshland, which um, you had told me something that, you know, I, I never knew before that something like 95% of um, marine life starts in the marshes or can you explain Not that? Marine or, life, but um, commercial fish and shellfish, the ones that we actually eat. So um, it, over 90% of all commercial fish and shellfish are either born in or around the wetlands to grow up in. So the baby animals have a good nursery in wetlands. And so wetlands such as like the, you know, I don't know, fluke, you know, flounder, that kind of stuff, or? Yeah, all sorts of small fish, small crustaceans will find a home in the wetlands because it offers shelter, it offers slow moving water. So when a lot of baby fish are born, they're so small, they're considered plankton. Out in the river or in the ocean, they'll get washed around by the current, but in the wetlands where the water is potentially not really moving, they can swim around, they can capture food, they can find places to hide amidst all those plants and so they can grow the, larger. For all the people who've watched um, SpongeBob SquarePants, just back up to, tell us again, plankton is but uh, well, there's plant and animal plankton, phytoplankton and zooplankton. But as far as zooplankton go, it's typically defined as any animal that cannot swim against the current. And so the majority of those are so a lot of here times, in Yeah, a lot of those consist of neuroplankton, which are baby animals that start as plankton, but as adults are no longer plankton. And what's the Some state of are always plankton. What? What are the, what's the state of our wetlands sort of nationally and here in New Jersey? Uh, it's been improving. Um, I mean, nationwide, about half of the wetlands or over half of the wetlands were destroyed um, in an effort to create more territory for agriculture and also to help limit the mosquito population, which of course didn't work because uh, mosquitoes are pretty relentless animals. They, they don't need full wetlands to reproduce. They just need a standing puddle, but a lot of their predators do need the wetlands. So by destroying all those wetlands, have actually increased the mosquito population uh, worldwide. And of course, destroying wetlands is, ne is never good because it helps us in other ways as well. Uh, in addition to all those animals that depend on it, including about 80% of birds, um, they also provide a buffer zone for humans. So they prevent flooding, they prevent erosion. So if you have a town, for instance, Cape May, that's right along the coast and you don't have wetlands there to protect it, 
it's not going to take long before the water takes the place of the land and I have to shift the town back and all those buildings end up underwater again. And one of our future uh, sessions we'll be speaking with um, Rutgers Haskins Laboratories about um, their program and living shorelines and the importance of those for um, a resilient coastline. One of, you know, so sort of backtracking back to your job about being a captain. So I want to ask all the questions that I asked when I first got here to the Bayshore Center, which is, you live on that boat? <laughs> so on a non-corona season, we live on the boat. <laughs> and you um, all live down there together. Yep. Yeah, there's three main living areas. The forecastle, which can house eight people. We like to keep it the four, but if we need to, we can put eight people in there. Uh, the main hold, um, which we can get another eight people in potentially, so it would be rather uncomfortable. And the uh, aft cabin, which we have four racks, those are usually full. Um, you can't stand in every place in the boat. A lot of areas have a very low overhead, so you have to make sure you duck or you hit your head. We've got our, um, our head, which is a, a toilet. A galley that consists of a, you know, refrigerator, um, a stove, and a sink. The main salon, which is basically a dining room, also a game area. It's like your, it's like your everything spot where you, you know, socialize. Um, the aft cabin is not only uh, where the officers sleep, but it's also our navigational area. So it's where we do all of our plotting and where a lot of our navigational equipment is kept. And we also have rooms that you don't uh, live in, like the engine room or the lion locker or the lazarette. The lazarette? Yeah, the lazarette is a small um, area on the stern of the boat that you access with a Bomar hatch, which is a big watertight um, metal door that you have to open and then you crawl in. Uh, you can only crawl in there. There's there's no sitting or. And is that just storage or? Um, on our boat, it's primarily uh, we like to keep it fairly empty in case it floods, so we can pump it out, which it it doesn't, but it, it could. Um, and we keep our emergency tiller in there, so if our wheel stopped working, we could uh, hook up a tiller to be able to steer the boat. So Other you guys are self sufficient. Not, you're self-sufficient on the boat. You're cooking, you're eating, you're bathing, you're playing games, plus you're running your business. Uh, bathing is a, a loose term. We, we do have a hose that, uh, hose. yeah, that's connected to a tank that's in the, in, the, um, in the engine room. So if we've been running the engine all day, you could get warm water, but otherwise it's gonna be pretty cold. Um, and then you're taking your shower on deck. For the whole so, world to see. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you are really talking up this job. Uh, it's, it's an experience, you know. Like you said, you live with the crew. You, you live with them, you work with them, you eat together, you sleep in the same area. So it's a good chance to get a second family or to, uh, to make uh, some pretty close friends and learn, like I said, new skills, not just sailing skills, but um, everybody has a different background. So you could learn about, you know, fire spinning or singing or playing an instrument or all sorts of things. Um, um, I imagine that you've seen some of the most amazing sunsets, sunrises, and some of the most beautiful places around the country. Yeah. Um, well, I could tell you about my best day ever. Tell us. Uh, I was on the bounty. Not the last day on the bounty, but the first day on the bounty. Um, we left port in Puerto Rico and uh, it was a clear day and the water was clear. And um, this was my first time ever sailing in the ocean because I came from clear water, you know, which is a, a one masted sloop to a fully rigged three masted ship. Um, and we're out in the ocean and 
we uh, climbed aloft and we set our topsail and we went out on the head rig and set our fore top mist staysail and we were under sail power and then uh, flying fish started leaping and there were hundreds of them. Wow. Big ones, not the small ones like in California, but the ones that are about three feet and they go far, you know, they could they can uh, cover a, a football field in about three jumps and they were amazing. And then there was a megapod of common dolphins chasing them. So over a hundred, uh, potentially close to 200 dolphins, they were everywhere uh, chasing these flying fish, which is really cool to see. I've never seen flying fish before that. I never saw common dolphins. It's not as common as you think pretty they have the black and the gray and the yellow pattern wow they look a lot different than a bottlenose and then we sailed into a big storm uh, the biggest one we were in until the hurricane we had 14 foot swells and we had to take in our sails so uh, i went out on the head rig and it was me and lee phelps and johnny slanga and uh we were dipping and getting hit by waves and Johnny kept yelling something that I couldn't hear because of the waves and the wind. And we got back up on deck and he said, I asked him what he was saying. He said, I love my job. <laughs> and then I, I uh, puked everywhere, all over. And then we had to climb aloft to bring in the uh, topsail. And as uh, we were climbing, humpback whales started breaching about Eight of them were around, but two breached almost simultaneously, one on either side of the boat. And then from the top with the clear water, you can see, you can see all the whales and there are about eight of them and they would breach at different times. And so the combination of the storm and the flying fish and the dolphins or the whales, it took us a really long time to bring in the sail, um, getting tossed around up there. And eventually we got the sail in, but it was too late. And I didn't make it all the way back down the deck before it threw up again. Wow. But I cleaned, cleaned that up for a while. Who was Out underneath about, you? What's that? Who was underneath you? Uh, nobody was under me, fortunately. It was just the, just the boat. So and then I had, to, well, I had to tell you about the best part, I will say, <laughs> if you want. No, go ahead. All right, so steering the boat for a while longer, and then um, as the sun was setting, it was the only time I've ever seen this, uh, as the, the clouds cleared up and the, the storm subsided, there were still really big swells. There were big swells for about four days. I was seasick for about four days. But as the sun was setting, um, there was a green light that stretched across the horizon, and then it a green light that kind of rose up right where the sun was at and went back down. It was kind of like the earth was breathing. Um, wow. they, they call that a uh, green flash. It was the only time I ever saw it. Wow. And then um, it was, uh, like I said, the, the clouds are clearing. We saw lots of shooting stars that night. And then when I looked overboard, um, there was bioluminescence everywhere. All the waves are crashing. And the coolest part for me, the whole thing, um, was that the dolphins, a lot of them were still following us. And so you could see the bioluminescence rolling down their bodies like they were magical glowing dolphins. When they would jump, they would still roll and, and they were illuminated. Well, that's a, probably one of the best stories I've heard about being on a tall ship. Yeah, so it's things like that. That's uh, kind of what kept me sailing. The um... You know, you know, certainly here in New Jersey, hopefully we don't have those kind of storms to, uh, uh, or we take our passengers out on that. But I did hear a really good story from uh, a woman who had been recently widowed, um, who went on the Mirwold a couple of years ago out of Atlantic Highlands. And she had said that um, she had lost her husband and it was gonna be the first Father's Day coming up with her children. And um, she didn't know what she was gonna do with them. And at the last minute, um, she bought tickets to go on the mirror wall. And Father's Day was a day she'd been dreading. Um, she just, you know, for the kids, for herself. Um, and so she bought tickets to go out on the mirror wall as a way to distract them on Father's Day. And uh, she said that a day she had been dreading had turned out to be the most wonderful day she had spent with her children since her husband had passed. And that there was this, you know, beautiful experience of being out on the water and that hearing the crew 
call orders back and forth to each other was sort of um, a uh, Sorry, uh, yeah, and and a relaxing place to be, and that she felt the presence of her husband in this moment with her kids, and and when I think about the Mirwald and I think about it's you know 92 years of operations here around the state of New Jersey. And I think about you being one of a line of captains that has um, you know, um, been a part of this crew and this organization uh, to make it so successful. It really is a job that I think you know, has greater impact than we'll ever know, right? You know, who knows? Uh, I, you know, one of our next guests is going to tell us about her experience on the mirror world and how it inspired her to be um, work as a marine biologist. But who knows all the lives that we touch when we go on the mirror world. You know, thousands of um, kids sail on the boat every year as part of field trips. Um, 4,000 people sailed on the boat last year. Um, and you know, for New Jersey to have that kind of history uh, and only, you know, I didn't even know about the boat before I came. It really is a a special, uh, a special place to be that I think can make a real difference in other people's lives. And I know you had a, um, a very scary experience on the bounty, um, and maybe we'll talk about that in more depth at another time. Um, but the, the bounty sank during Hurricane Sandy um, when you were on board, and um, the story is horrific. I wonder, um, you know, the story is interesting in and of itself. But to go beyond just sort of being a voyeur in that story, how did you how did you get back on the horse again? How did you get back on the boat again? I, you know, for me, I think I would swear off ever stepping on a boat again after being in the middle of the ocean during a hurricane when a boat sinks. So you know, for for people who struggle out there, whether it's literally falling off a bike and being afraid to get back up again, to far bigger, scarier things that we have to learn to do again. How did you do it? How did you get back on the boat? Um, I didn't want that to get me down. I didn't want something like that to stop me from doing something that I enjoyed doing. Um, I was working at the aquarium actually when I decided I was gonna get on a boat again. And that was mainly because of the mirror wall um, because um, while I was working at Adventure Aquarium, I would often see the Mirwald sail by um, in the Delaware River there. And I was like, hmm, kind of miss doing that because I had been, I had stopped sailing for almost, well, about two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but it was, it stays kind of like what I mentioned earlier. Um, where you see amazing sunsets or meteor showers or whales or it's um, the job is so much different than any other job really because like I said you you have a crew who's also kind of like a family you know you're you're always um, experiencing new things you're creating these bonds that you would never get at a normal job where you go home every night um and to be honest, a nine to five is uh, boring. Um, I kind of like the spontaneity. It's, it creates a spark. It, um, I like exploration. I like adventure. Um, and that provides kind of all of those things. So I didn't want to just give up on that. Uh, and just a, a side note on something you mentioned earlier, you had mentioned, uh, uh, well, we had talked about affecting passengers and things like that, but another, um, another thing that I enjoyed about the captain's job is potentially having an impact on the crew because the mirror world, um, just because of the type of boat it is and, and where it is, is often people's a lot of times it's people's first um, tall ship or second. Um, so it's kind of like the first impression they get of what it's like to live on and be on a boat. And so you have an opportunity here to create an amazing experience that they'll want to repeat over and over again, or give them a horrible experience and they'll never want to do it again. 
Um, so not only do I have the, uh, like I said, the privilege to help out and um, impact the public, but I also get to have a pretty good impact on the crew, which um, I found out from some crew this year was kind of a, a big deal that I didn't really think about before. Yeah, you know, I think, um, well, I know that you've been an extraordinary captain and um, I've certainly feel privileged to have the opportunity to work with you um, and, you know, the crew and, and if anyone's interested in crewing, they should reach out to us here. It is a, a great opportunity for a diverse group of people. You know, we've had people on the boat who have had PhDs to people who didn't graduate high school. And, and what I like about it is, that, you know, both of those sort of fit together. Um, and they work well together. And the um, a lot of the uh, sort of barriers to our social, you know, socioeconomic socialization are, are removed when you're on the tall ship and you're working together. Um, and I love getting the kids on Bob. For a lot of kids, it's the only time or first time they've ever been on a boat, certainly been on a sailboat. Um, they don't know where the Delaware Bay is or that, you know, New Jersey. Um, and the Delaware Bay are actually connected uh, to each other. And so having that um, experience um, is a really great experience. I think for kids, it's you know so unique and we're lucky to have the supporters we do to make it possible uh, here at the Bayshore Center. It, you know, in parting thoughts for you, Josh, would you recommend the job to you know the next generation? Uh, and if so, how, did, how the heck does someone become a tall ship captain? You know, if I'm a kid, and I'm in junior high or high school and, you know, I, I like the water. I don't know anything about it. I live in Iowa. You know, I don't have the opportunity. Um, what would you tell a kid like that? Uh, <laughs> well, I, like I said, I went to college um, and I got a biology degree, which really has nothing to do with sailing, but I'm not gonna say that that's not helpful. It helps every day with the environmental education programming. So I'd still recommend going to college. You might also consider um, pursuing a maritime school. There's actual schools like Maine Maritime and Clatsop Community College, where you become like a cadet at Maine Maritime and you're there for years. Um, it's just like going to college. And uh, when you come out of it, a lot of people come out with an unlimited uh, third mate's license, uh, which would be pretty easy for you to get a hundred ton captain's license after you get that. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's a combination of things. You know, you want the experience and you also want the education. So you need to get out there and um, hop on a boat. You know, don't, don't be afraid to start as a volunteer um, because it's, well, one, it's humbling and two, um, you're going to learn a lot and you're going to, like I said, you're going to meet some cool people and they're going to teach you just so much information. So go into it with an open head, even if um, you already have a lot of experience sailing as a small boat sailor, you're going to grasp everything a lot faster and you'll have a lot to contribute to the crew, but you also learn um, things because small boat sailing and tall ship sailing are even though they're similar, also very different because on a tall ship, you're like, it's like a clock and you're one of the gears, you're part, you're one of the pieces that make the whole thing work. No one person can sail the boat. And so you need everybody to do it. And so it's a different style of sailing, a different style of learning. But yeah, I would say, you know, start, it's okay to start at the bottom. Um, and there are ships all over the country. Yeah, there's, right, there's tall ships. I believe there's about 300 of them just in the United States. Wow, really? And so you can go to Tall Ships America, which is yeah. our association, and, and they have a bullet bank that job listing for potential jobs and volunteer opportunities. Certainly people are, can reach out to us here at the Bayshore Center and the H.A. Mirwalt to, uh, uh, to potentially uh, work on the boat. Josh, I would uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you for you know being an amazing captain on the Mirror World. We've received uh, 
so many accolades to your work and compliments to your work. I know that for me personally, it's been um, a real pleasure to not just work with you, but to be a passenger on the mirror world when you go out. And I know that um, this 2020 season was challenging. We have the 2021 season coming up. And um, I think a, a little bit of information for people is that we will be um, sailing out of bivalve largely this year uh, for the 2021 season again. So we look forward to having people come here. But um, at the end of the 2021 season, so in September 2021, which is only nine months away now, um, the Mirror World will uh, sail up to Maine for nine months for her second major restoration. And uh, in a future uh, segment, we'll be uh, talking with the shipwrights who will be leading mm -hmm. that effort. So Josh, thank you again for coming on and uh, talking to us. And we look forward to seeing you on the deck of the Mirror World. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for being a good director. Um, thanks for the compliments. Um, but part of being a decent captain is having a great crew. So um, I can't say that I'm a good captain without having a good crew. So we have to thank them for that as well. That's right. Um, yeah, hopefully you guys will join us soon. We're going to be going out in the bay. We're going to have lighthouse sales and five hour birding sales and multicultural music wine and cheese sales. So lots of exciting stuff for next year. Great. Thanks, Thanks again, Josh. Take care. Have a good one. <laughs>